MPs, especially from New South Wales, where poker machines are most prolific, began to revolt under pressure from poker machine clubs in their electorates. Representing the large poker machine clubs, many with hundreds of machines, was Clubs Australia. Uh, and faced with a system that could curb problem gamblers' spending and therefore reduce their, the club's massive profits, the industry immediately shelled out millions of dollars on its un-Australian un campaign and promised a $40 million war chest to fight the reforms. And the federal government, and the Prime Minister especially, went to water early on, seemingly unable to rebut the clubs and to fight their case for reform. And for those who aren't from, New, from uh, Australia, most, most of you aren't, we have clubs. I think the Penrith Panthers has, what, about seven or 800 machines. They have a turnover of about $100 million a year. Uh, although they're still, was it the Penriths who lose money, Paul? Yes. Yeah, they make $100 million from poker machines, but they still manage to lose millions of dollars each year. You go figure in terms of the way they manage their businesses. The clubs campaign in the greatest traditions of propaganda focused on fear rather than truth. According to Clubs Australia, gamblers would have to sign up for a licence, a licence to punt that would allow them to place a bet. Who voted for a licence to punt they funded? And I think we've got some of the, some of the, uh, there we go, who voted for a licence to punt? It was almost as though uh, it was, uh, that was their campaign. They rolled it out in every club and they were targeting MPs because mandatory commitment that have all your data, all your information, never mind that most members of clubs have got a card which carries much more information than they would, than this would ever have because all that was being proposed was to have a database with your details, not your player details because that would be contained on the card. That's what was recommended by the Joint Committee. And who voted to cut community sport? Now, this is one of the great lies of the industry, that community sport will, will die, uh, kids sport will die if you don't have poker machine revenue from clubs. Well. What the clubs conveniently ignore, as in, in Western Australia, where they don't have pubs, where they don't have pubs and clubs and poker machines, where they have the lowest expenditure by far on gambling in the rest of the country by virtue of their absence of poker machines, guess what? Their level of participation in community sports is higher than anywhere else in the Commonwealth of Australia. So that just puts a lie to that. So when they say that, you know, kids won't be able, you won't be able to afford to pay jumpers for our kids, well, it comes at enormous cost in New South Wales, particularly, and other parts of the country. And Western Australia, they seem to do very well without poker machines. Like I'm some sort of criminal? Well, the PM signed up for it. See, some bloke in Tassie got voted in, and Gillard needs his vote, and he hates pokies. No way. The licence to have a punt? It's not Australia. I don't know. I mean, what's next? They'll be coming with how many beers they have next. Gillard would be crazy to back that, wouldn't she? Never happened. Will it? The National Rugby, Rugby League even joined in to, the, in, in to claim that sport in Australia would be destroyed if the reforms were allowed to pass. When the ads first came out, the way the pre-commitment scheme would be structured hadn't been confirmed. Instead, a joint select committee on gambling reform was established and tasked with examining the issue of pre-commitment and making recommendations to the government. An inquiry was opened, submissions were taken and hearings were held. The majority of the committee concluded, that was Andrew Wilkie, myself and government members, that voluntary pre-commitment, the club's preferred system, was essentially useless. If pre-commitment was to act as a safety measure, it had to be mandatory. And as my good friend Tim Costello, who runs World Vision Australia, a long time anti-gambling campaigner, uh, voluntary pre-commitment is a bit like voluntary seatbelt laws or voluntary drink driving laws and he makes the point that if it's voluntary pre-commitment people won't use it that need it the most because they'll be too stigmatised to be seen to be using it in a hotel or a club. Uh, we don't have voluntary speed limits, we don't have voluntary drink driving laws. In the end the recommendation was for a combination scheme where pre-commitment would apply to the high intensity poker machines only, the high loss machines, the $1200 hour machines that we have now that existing machines could be altered to run at a lower intensity, the $1 bets with $120 hourly losses capped, and therefore we would need a pre-commitment card to operate. So from the beginning, the debate was clouded with false accusations and a desperate attempt by the clubs to cause some sort of national revolt against a reasonable and evidence-based harm minimisation measure. And so gambling reform in Australia is much harder than it looks. If you consider the two sides of the argument, it seemed fairly obvious. There is overwhelming public support for reform. 
For example, a survey conducted by the, uh, in Victoria by the Centre for Gambling Research found that 80% of Victorian adults consider that gambling does more harm than good, and that's reflected across the nation. But governments, both state and federal, seem more willing to listen to industry groups and the people who voted them in. And, uh, and for the state governments, the biggest uh, pokey addicts of all is just a case of just one more spin. But the saddest thing is that in all of this, somewhere in the middle of all of this, the real story got lost. The argument became about promises and lies and leadership battles, but what this must really be about and what it has always been about was the people damaged by this very dangerous product. A study commissioned by the Victorian Department of Justice and released in 2009 found that more than 12,000 Victorians contemplate suicide every year because of their poker machine addiction. The study found that also 6,000 Victorians contemplate breaking the law because of their addiction. You repeat that nationally by fourfold or fivefold, and you can see that it's a massive national problem. And another six month long study at a major Victorian hospital found that one in five five suicidal patients that presented at that hospital uh, did so directly because of gambling, because of their problem with poker machines. I won't quote all the evidence, there's too much both from Australia and overseas. Studies have shown that an increase in gambling activity leads to mental health problems, to crime, to increased unemployment and the breakdown of the community social fabric. So where do we go from here? Well, New Zealand, and this, it hurts me to say this about New Zealand, to praise New, the Kiwis, but you have been miles ahead of us in many respects in terms of the way you undertake your research, in terms of the way that you've dealt with problem gambling. And in fact, when I was here about 10 years ago, um, that GP program where uh, general practitioners had a role in identifying problem gambling, that was adopted uh, in Australia, and that's something I pushed for, and that was, I think, a tremendous uh, early intervention measure to, to allow GPs at the front line of medical services to, to give people assistance in identifying their problem. Much, but much more needs to be done both here and across the Tasman, and we need to work together to achieve that. We've come a long way on these issues, but we still have a long way to go, and it'll be an uphill battle all the way. We've had a chance for national reform in Australia, and even though it's passed for the moment, things are certainly not the same as they were. The boulder hasn't rolled all the way back to the bottom of the hill. So I think it's important that we catch our breath, put our backs into it, and make sure that the rock goes all the way over the crest and stays there because after all lives depend on it.